Hi everyone, my name is Michael Stewart. I'm the Director of Education here at the OI Foundation. And today I'm gonna to be talking with Dr. Robert Sandy Sandhouse, a member of our uh, Medical Advisory Council, who is gonna be talking to us about COVID-19 vaccine questions. Uh, we have received a bunch of questions here at the foundation over the past couple of weeks and months, and he's going to be spending some time just uh, giving some quick answers to some of our most frequent questions that we get. Uh, Dr. Sandhouse, thank you so much for being with us today. My pleasure. Um, um, it's good to see you, and it's good to have you all listen to this. I did want to make sure that people know that I actually have no relationship with any vaccine companies or any uh, conflicts of interest that uh, might arise if I had been uh, in some way connected with vaccine industry or COVID treatments or things like that. I'm just I'm just a lowly pulmonary critical care doctor who uh, has a, a special interest in COVID and and the alpha and the uh, osteogenesis imperfecta foundation. Thank you so much, Dr. Sandhouse, and uh, we are so appreciative that you can spend time with us today. Um, so I'm going to jump right into it to some of the questions right. that we've been getting frequently. Um, I want to start off with a big question. How do vaccines help both the individual and society? Well, that's a key question for people considering getting the vaccine or people wondering uh, uh, what the benefits might be and the risks. We'll talk about the risks, I'm sure, um, during the course of this. But to concentrate on the benefits, right now, the only um, successful specific treatment or therapy that we have is the prevention of COVID uh, uh, severe infection uh, by getting a vaccine, which essentially uh, tweaks the body's own immune system uh, to fight the virus. Um, so for a given individual considering the vaccine, um, one reason to take it is to protect themselves. Um, there have actually been no deaths due to COVID in people who have received any of the vaccines that are available to treat COVID-19 or to prevent COVID-19. Um, it is true that there have been documented infections uh, uh, with COVID in people who've received the vaccine, but in general, they've been quite mild and haven't led to hospitalizations or intensive care unit stays or death. So it not only keeps you from getting it, if you do by chance get it, um, and that's a rare uh, subset of people who've been vaccinated, you um, are virtually guaranteed of having uh, no uh, significant infection. Um, but the benefits of vaccine um, go beyond protecting the individual. Um, if enough people become vaccinated, then it's possible to eradicate the COVID-19 infection from the population. Um, if this were an island nation um, and uh, enough people got vaccinated, um, we could eradicate COVID-19 from the US population. The problem is we're not an island. Even if we were an island, if we had an airport, um, we uh, the, the goal has to be to vaccinate enough people around the world um, in order to eliminate uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus uh, from circulation and stop this pandemic. Um, the same has been true for vaccines throughout the ages. Um, the major impetus um, for, the, uh, for, for preventing deaths from measles, from mumps, from uh, chicken pox, from uh, rubella. Um, the, the, the reason that over the last century, we've doubled the life expectancy of people in the United States and all of the Western worlds um, has primarily been due to vaccination against infectious diseases. Um, and we've eliminated things like smallpox um, purely by vaccinating enough people so that the circulation of that virus through the world has been essentially eliminated. Um, there's enough hesitation about getting the COVID vaccine that experts are now predicting that we will never reach what's called herd immunity, where the, where the number of people infect, infected uh, drops far below the uh, number of people who are protected against the uh, the virus. Um, so um, 
I'm not willing to give up on developing herd immunity, but herd immunity from the for the world, uh, including countries that are underprivileged or are uh, um, behind in the vaccination process, is something that will probably take years. So the best way to protect yourself as an individual is to get vaccinated, and the best way to protect uh, the world from this pandemic is to get sufficient numbers of people vaccinated that we can actually put a stop to the transmission of the virus. Great, thank you so much. Uh, the next question we have is about uh, side effects. So a common question we get at the, the foundation is, are people with OI getting any side effects or adverse reactions to the vaccine? And are those different than what we're hearing about from the general public? So um, first of all, uh, there are side effects that people have reported from the vaccine. There have been rare, serious side effects. Uh, The fact is that uh, none of the side effects have been directly fatal to people. Um, And uh, the vast, vast majority of people who receive the vaccine have no side effects whatsoever. Um, as long as we say that no side effects includes a little bit of soreness in the arm where you got your injection. Um, There is no evidence that this has more side effects, for instance, than the annual flu vaccine. Um, But as everyone knows, um, when some side effect occurs, um, the reporting of it is dramatic. You know, no one stands in front of a camera to report that Tom had a vaccine and had no side effects. It's only when something happens. And the two side effects that most people have heard of um, are um, this uh, uh, serious allergic reactions or anaphylaxis um, that occurred and was found early on in the uh, mass uh, vaccination uh, of people with, uh, with at risk of COVID. Um, you have to remember that, um, number one, we, we concentrated on vaccinating elderly people first. And so elderly people in nursing homes tend to die. Um, And so the the good news is that in evaluating for excess deaths among people who are vaccinated, there's been no evidence, even in elderly uh, individuals who have other underlying diseases, there's been no evidence that there's an increase in the deaths of people who receive the vaccine. In fact, there's been a decrement, a decrease in the number of deaths because deaths from COVID were dramatically decreased by getting the vaccine. Um, In the allergic reactions you've heard about, basically those have only occurred in people that have a strong history of serious allergic reactions. Um, There have been no uh, uh, deaths um, since that was identified. Um, That's primarily because we took the simple step of observing people Um, after they were vaccinated so that we could treat an allergic reaction as quickly as possible. And um, we have uh, asked people about their history of severe allergic reactions. And if they do have that history, they still get the vaccine. They just get it in a more closely supervised uh, medical setting. Um, The uh, question about blood clots and things like that due to certain vaccines has pretty much been eliminated as a risk Um, for those vaccines when you looked at the general population and the number of people who got those uh, clotting problems in the general population who didn't get vaccinated. Um, There are many more clotting problems in people who get COVID infections um, than in people who've been vaccinated. So uh, it's tough to measure risks and benefits for a given individual, but the fact is it's been a very safe vaccine And the alternative of not getting vaccinated is far more dangerous than the alternative uh, uh, of getting the vaccine. And for those people who say, well, I'll let everyone else get the vaccine because that will eliminate COVID and I don't have to worry about it because I'm uh, hesitant about getting the vaccine. The fact is, if we don't get herd immunity, you're not protected by everyone else getting the vaccine. It really is a matter of protecting yourself and your family. Thank you so much. Um, We really appreciate these really fantastic, thorough answers. Um, One big question we're getting, and I think all the parents want want to know this who are watching this right now, is 
when do you think children with OI will be able to get vaccinated? And should these families have any special considerations for their children getting vaccinated? That again, are similar to the last question, that are there any special distinctions children with OI should have thinking about getting vaccinated compared to the general population? Great, yeah, I did, I did um, uh, not address one of the questions that you, that you just put to me about whether there's more side effects uh, to vaccine in the OI population. And I have to say both uh, the OI population as well as a number of rare disease populations, uh, the organizations associated with them like the OI Foundation um, have been monitoring the, uh, the side effects that people have had. And there's absolutely no evidence that um, OI patients uh, would have more side effects uh, or worse side effects than the general population. Um, logically, from a mechanistic uh, point of view, is what the mechanisms are of getting sore arms, of getting anaphylactic reactions and things like that, there's no um, medical reason to think that an OI patient would have more side effects than the general population. In terms of kids getting vaccinated, as you probably have heard, and by the time you see this, it may already be a fact, um, uh, at least one company has already um, studied uh, the use of the vaccine in kids uh, 12 years of age and up, and already has sufficient data to document that uh, it's safe and effective in that age group. And uh, by the second or third week of May, we may very well have an authorization to treat kids 12 and up. It's interesting to know that kids 12 and up get exactly the same dose uh, of vaccine in these studies as do adults in terms of the vaccine. For the two-dose vaccines, it's still the same. Two doses for the one-dose vaccine, which um, is now back and available, uh, same dose uh, is being tested. They're uh, the, the single dose is not yet approved in, in kids. Um, so uh, if you look at what a healthy 12-year-old looks like in terms of height and, and, uh, and weight, it certainly suggests that um, people uh, of store, short stature uh, or low weight uh, should probably get exactly the same dosing as individuals um, uh, do who are adults. Um, I, I know that uh, there are studies going on in infants now. Um, I don't know when they'll be completed, but for infants from six months of age up through 12 years of, of age. And there is um, some suggestion that lower dosing uh, may be sufficient in uh, infants, but we have to wait and see what the clinical trial results are. Um, so I encourage uh, once that's approved for, for parents to make sure that their kids get uh, vaccinated as as the approvals come through, and uh, it should be reassuring to uh, people of short stature and low weight um, in OI that uh, the dosing uh, that's being recommended is appropriate for them. Obviously, there are is specific issues with OI. For instance, if there's not a lot of muscle mass in the in the arms, we in, we encourage um, patients to proactively. Uh, make sure that they, uh, there's someone at the site of vaccination that can do, for instance, leg uh, intramuscular injections and things along those lines. But that's about the only uh, real precaution or, or change uh, for the OI population. Thank you so much. Those are such, that's such helpful information. Um, so you have talked about this a little bit before, but I want to make sure we're understanding you. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like, well, question one is, so are allergic reactions or anaphylaxis, that those like extreme allergic reactions, um, how often are those happening? And is this something that you can just, you know, for people that get those types of allergic reactions, do you solve this simply by like, if you're a person that, you know, has an EpiPen, do you just bring that with you? Well, we do encourage people who have a history of allergic reactions to bring an EpiPen, but all of the vaccination sites should have epinephrine available. That's what's in an EpiPen, mm -hmm. um, Benadryl and, and steroids, which are the treatments for any anaphylactic reaction and um, are usually right on hand um, at uh, 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 vaccination sites. Yeah. I think if you know that you have had significant allergic reactions to other medications or things like that, 
um, that you probably want to get your your uh, vaccination at a healthcare facility or hospital rather than at a at a doctor's office where the doctors just started giving vaccinations because they they may not have all those things on hand. Although I do believe that um, any site that uh, is approved to give vaccines must be prepared uh, for those kind of reactions, including pharmacies. So th there are usually those uh, emergency medications available. Um, it's still an extremely rare occurrence, whether you have OI or you don't. Uh, those kind of allergic reactions, even in people who have a strong allergic history, have been very rare. Thank you. Um, an another quick question. You spoke about this a bit before, but so uh, true or false, um, people with OI, regard, uh, say if you want to get a two-shot vaccine, so like Moderna or Pfizer, regardless of their uh, height and weight, will be getting two shots. So whether you have type three, type three or four OI that is a little bit more uh, moderate or severe, or say you have type one OI, or you are an NBA basketball player who's seven foot three, you are going to get two shots. For the two shot, for the two shot resumes, yes. yes. And, and to answer a question you didn't ask because it's something that's been uh, coming up a lot for our Canadian patients is, um, should I always get the second shot uh, uh, that is exactly the same as the shot that you got for your first vaccination against oh, COVID? Switching. In other words, if you get Pfizer for your first shot, can you get Moderna for the second one? Because because that's closer to me than the than Pfizer or the place uh, uh, told me they're out of Pfizer, but they have Moderna. The fact is we still do recommend that you try to get the same Vaccine. In fact, the, the, our recommendations are, yes, you should get the same vaccine. In Canada, there's been some laxity of that because their vaccine availability is more strained uh, than it is in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, the argument there has been it's better to get a second shot from any pro of any product than to not get a second shot. Um, the problem there is that the vaccines are all against the spike protein of the coronavirus. But each vaccine looks at a different aspect of that spike protein. So if you can imagine the first shot of a, of a vaccine in a two shot regimen builds up a certain level of immunity to, that, to those portions of the, of the spike protein that are in that vaccine or that are made by mm -hmm. that vaccine. When you get that second dose, it shoots up the antibody quantities um, of those uh, that you've already become relatively immune to. Um, if you get Pfizer as an example for the first one and Moderna for the second, there might be some aspects that they have in common and those will shoot up. But for the ones that aren't in common, you'll have small amounts of antibodies to that from the Pfizer and small amount of antibodies to that from the Moderna or the Johnson & Johnson or whatever. And the uh, the immunity probably won't be as dramatic. And of course, why do you need that dramatic response? Because you have to be able to um, really fight that virus when it approaches. And you actually have to be able to have really high uh, titers of this antibody, titers meaning quantity, um, so that for instance, if you get a variant of the virus uh, attacking you, that there's so much antibody that it can find the common areas that aren't mutated and still attack it. And so for, for vaccine variants that are mutated from the original SARS-CoV-2 virus, right now we're lucky enough that the uh, mutations and the variants that are making their way through the United States all seem to be hit to certain levels equally well with the different, with the different vaccines. That could change in the future, I'm sorry to say, especially if we don't get herd immunity uh, in the country and drive down the, the number of infections. But for now, that's one reason to get both vaccines the same is that you really have those high titers to fight and whatever variant comes along. Gotcha. Thank you. Next question. Do the vaccines change my DNA? Well, the vaccines that are currently being used and the vaccines that we look forward to in the future that are still in testing, none of them change someone's DNA. 
Um, I realize there's some confusion about that. Number one, because people are trying to confuse people on social media. But number two, because several of the vaccines do affect the mechanism that cells use to make proteins. They are those mRNA vaccines do jump in to the cell and turn the cell into a factory that makes the spike protein so that the body reacts to it and makes antibodies. But the mRNA is in the cytoplasm of the cell, not in the cell nucleus where the DNA is. And it doesn't get into the cell nucleus where the DNA is. And there's no mechanism by which it would change someone's DNA. And um, uh, so this is really uh, a reasonable concern in some people and a made up concern <laughs> for others. But there's no, um, there's no real mechanism that, that um, one could imagine uh, that the current vaccines would in any way change an individual's DNA. Thank you. Um, in regards to other, you know, Concerns. theory sounding things we've been hearing. So do these vaccines, is there evidence of them uh, basically, are there, is there evidence of the vaccines sterilizing people? And is there evidence of the vaccines causing problems with pregnancy? So the, um, this is a question that, that both men and women have. Um, uh, the good news is that we know a little about this. Um, in, the, in the thousands and thousands of people that have been in vaccine trials and that have received vaccine, there have been thousands of pregnancies that have occurred during those trials and in people who received the vaccine. Um, in the trials where people were monitored much more closely, women who've become pregnant there's been no increase in the number of birth defects or aborted fetuses, you know, uh, miscarriages. Um, and people of women have survived and their, and their infants have survived very well, even though they've been vaccinated either during pregnancy or just before pregnancy. And the fertility rates in both men and women have remained unchanged in those th studies of thousands and thousands of patients who've been vaccinated. So there's no reason to believe that, uh, uh, the vaccine would make people sterile um, or affect uh, the development of fetuses uh, uh, who became you know, in women who've become pregnant either bef uh, after getting the vaccine or getting the vaccine during pregnancy. But the good news is not only theoretically should there be no difference in practice when we've actually looked at pregnancies and fertility, um, there's been no problems for, uh, created by the vaccines, no matter what type of vaccine we're talking about. Thank you so much. Um, so my last question for, for you today is a bit broader. So you hear a lot about people com you know, complaining who are maybe a little bit hesitant about these vaccines that they go, these were rushed. These were the quickest developed vaccines ever in human history. There's no way we can totally know what they're gonna to do to people long-term. And therefore I personally, I'm gonna wait and see what happens in regards to long-term effects. Um, one, question number one is, were these vaccines rushed? Like they, they were developed quickly, but I think developed quickly and rushed are different things. Um, and I want to get your thoughts on that, your opinion. And then number two is that reasoning around, I want to wait to see what happens. Is that a good line of reasoning? But what is your response to that as well? well these, are, these are great questions and questions that people can reasonably ask. I mean, the fact is, I, I, the word rush, as you implied, has the implication that things were done fast and sloppy. Yeah. Things were done fast and well for these vaccines. Um, the main re the main way that these were gotten to market uh, to into arms so quickly um, was that uh, for most drugs and vaccines, um, the tried and true mechanism for getting them approved by the regulatory authorities is to do a series of trials sequentially. 
what's called phase one, where you look at a small number of people to make sure the drug is safe to give. Phase two, where you start to look at whether antibodies are being produced using vaccines as the example. Phase three, where you, where you give it to thousands and thousands of people to make sure that it actually does what you want it to do, kill the, you know, kill the virus, prevent the virus from uh, infecting you, prevent uh, deaths, prevent hospitalizations. And usually that's a multi-year process to do one, evaluate it, the second, evaluate it, the third, and roll it and, va- and, yeah. and validate it. Well, the major way that, this, that um, the time was saved in the development of these vaccines was many of these studies were done concurrently. So that you start a phase one study. After you see in the first, you know, several hundred people that get it, that there's been no major safety issues. You continue to do that phase one study, but you start the phase two study, enrolling a lot more patients. And then once that phase two study has started and you look at the preliminary data, you overlap a phase three study on top of it, which is this huge multi-thousand patient study. And then you take a look in that phase three study early to see whether there's a significant difference between those who got study drug vaccine and those who got a sham infusion, a sham injection of a control, a placebo, to see if there's differences in the infection rates in those two groups and difference in the safety in those two groups. And so, um, for instance, talking about the pregnancy issue, um, when they looked at, one of the companies looked at the whether there were any miscarriages in the in the in the phase three study, they did find a woman, one woman who had a miscarriage, and when they eventually looked at the data, they found out she was in the control group that didn't get the vaccine. Hmm. So um, uh, that was a great time saver. Those those phase one, two, and three studies are still carried to their completion. And for instance, for the Pfizer drug. All of those studies, one phase one, two, and three, with their multiple tens and hundreds of thousands of people, have now been completed, and Pfizer is ready to go from an emergency youth use emergency use authorization, which was based on the first several thousand people in their uh, in their phase three trial. Now phase one, phase two, phase three are done, and they can go back to the FDA and say, "Let's change this to a usual authorization." It's still even that has gone quicker because mm-hmm. of that overlap of studies. And then the major thing that uh, allows these studies to go forward rapidly is that these were done in the midst of a pandemic. For instance, to develop a new flu vaccine, you're developing that before the flu has hit. And so your ability to enroll patients who um, have that particular flu is affected by when the flu vaccine appears. Um, so the, uh, there are many factors that went into being able to do this as quickly and as competently as it was done. And then the final factor is the amount of money that was thrown at this development. So they could afford to do these concurrent studies with thousands and thousands of people for each virus. There was money flowing from the world into these companies so that they could work as fast as they possibly could. And they continued those studies, even if the virus, even if the vaccines got their emergency use use organization, (laughs) their Mm -hmm. emergency use authorizations um, so that they could um, uh, continue to learn about it. And now confirmed that their initial results were correct. Thanks to continuing those studies. Great. And I'm, and I'm sure I didn't answer the entire question. Can you um, remind me about my, things I've forgotten? <laughs> so the, the, the second part of my question was, so th- this reasoning of for an individual, an individual level, hey, I want to wait to see what happens yeah. if I get my shot. Um, what, what is your response to that reasoning? So I guess the question is, what else could someone be waiting for? Because now that hundreds of millions of people have been vaccinated, and basically in people who are vaccinated, there haven't been uh, uh, side effects. If you, if you, you know, you're talking about 98, 99% of the people who have been vaccinated who had no significant side effects at all. Um, And it's prevented all those people from uh, getting severe COVID infections. And for the 
vast majority of them from getting COVID infection at all. Um, the question then becomes, what more are you waiting for to take the leap and get your vaccine? Um, you know, and I'll emphasize once again, if you're waiting for the rest of the country or the rest of the world to be vaccinated to the extent that it will keep you from getting COVID-19, unfortunately, that's not going to happen, it looks like, because of the people who have definitely decided not to get the vaccine. That percentage is so high that really the reason to get it is to protect yourself and your family. Great. Dr. Sandhouse, thank you so much for being with us today. My pleasure. Yeah. So if you have any questions for the OI Foundation, please reach us at www.oif.org. Uh, that's uh, where our website is. And there you can find a COVID-19 toolkit. Many of the resources were actually written by Dr. Sandhouse here. So you can find lots more that we've done there, uh, including if you want to find a vaccine, we have a link to a helpful vaccine uh, finder there as well. Um, if you have questions about OIF, you can reach us directly at bonelink at oif.org and send us a quick email. Uh, thank you all so much for being with us. Uh, Dr. Sandhouse, do you have a, a final uh, word for us? I do. You know, the OI uh, community uh, is one that likes to be informed, and I'm happy to help do that. I will say that in uh, uh, questionnaires that people with OI have filled out, um, 81% of those have said they will get the vaccine. That's much higher than the general population. Once again, demonstrating the high intelligence rate among individuals with OI. Um, and really, we're, this is entirely geared towards the other 19% um, who still are wondering whether they should get it. And, and I encourage them all uh, to get the vaccine and as soon as you can. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. I get my second shot on Saturday and I am looking forward to it. Congratulations. Yeah. Okay. Thank you all so much. Thank you.